When my system is a little bit more complicated, for instance, if I had two masses here, so I would add one here, spring constant K, spring constant K, I could repeat this experiment. And if I did that, I would find two resonance frequencies. And if I do it with three objects, I would find three resonance frequencies. I did it with five, I would find five resonance frequencies. And when I make then this curve of A amplitude as a function of frequency, either hertz or in radians per second, whichever you prefer, then if I had three objects there in a row, you would see something like this. And depending upon how many of these objects you have, you get more and more resonances. And these resonances can all be found by driving the system and searching for them. If I go to a system whereby I have an infinite number of these masses, we call them coupled oscillators, these oscillators are coupled through the springs, an infinite number of coupled oscillators would be a violin string. Here's a violin string. And the reason why I call it infinitely number of oscillators is that I can think of each atom or each molecule as being driven, as being connected by springs to the neighbor, and so it's an infinite number of coupled oscillators. And so when I start to shake this system, I would expect a lot of resonances, and that's what I want to explore with you now. In the case here that the objects move in the same direction of the spring, I call this the y direction and I call this the x direction. So the spring is in the x direction, the objects, the beats are in the x direction and the oscillations are in the x direction. We call those longitudinal oscillations. There is also a way that you can have transverse oscillations, transverse, whereby the motion is in the y direction, whereas the beats are in the x direction. I could even do that with this system. I could make them oscillate like this, because the springs will obviously also work if I do this with the system. And that's the way I want this p violin string or pi piano string to oscillate now, because that's the only meaningful way that I can make it oscillate. And so I wonder if I'm going to drive it here by shaking it up and down, searching for the resonance frequencies, what I will be seeing. If I go at very low frequencies, the string laughs at me. The string does nothing. It's just bored. It doesn't respond to me. I am somewhere here in the resonance curve. But then when I increase the frequency, slowly I hit the very first frequency at which it likes to oscillate. I call that F1. And when I look at the spring, and you will see that shortly, the string will oscillate like so. It will go up here and it will go down here. And all it will do is this. That's his first resonance. And I call this N equals one, often called the first harmonic. And then I go to higher frequencies and it will not do very much. It's very unhappy. And then all of a sudden I hit a second resonance. I call that F2. And the second resonance will show up like this. This point of the string will not move at all. When this part is up, this part will be down. I call that S n equals two. And it oscillates like so. And this point, which is not moving at all, we call that a node. I go a little bit beyond that second resonance and nothing happens, the, spring, the string will be quite unhappy, sort of flutters a little bit, until I hit another resonance, F3. And then, with the next resonance, I will see two nodes appear, one here and one here. And this, the string will oscillate like so. This goes up and down, 180 degrees out of phase, and these two ends are in phase. This is n equals three. And I can go on like that and add nodes, and I will show you some of that very shortly. The 
frequency that I generate, I call that f of n, n is an integer, it could be 1, 2, 3, or 4, is linear in f1. In other words, if f1 were 100 hertz, then f2 would be 200 hertz, and f3 would be 300 hertz. We call n equals 1, we call that the first harmonic. Some books also call it the fundamental. I will call it the first harmonic. And we call n equals 2 the second harmonic, and so on. n equals 3 is the third harmonic. So we're going to get a series of discrete frequencies which are equally spaced. F1 depends on the length of the string, on the tension, I will write tension, don't confuse this with period, and it depends on the mass of the string. Without going into the detail how the dependence is, these are the parameters that determine the first harmonic. I have here a very special violin string, or piano string, whatever you want to call this, and we can generate these resonance frequencies by searching for them. And I would need assistance from a student. Would you be willing to help me? So you hand, hand one, hold one end of the piano string in your hand. Don't let it go, please, don't let it go. I promise you I won't let it go either. Okay, so I put a certain tension on it, and I start to shake at a very low frequency. Look how low. And look how happy this string is. Nothing. It just laughs at me, it ignores me, it doesn't like me. Now I'm going to increase the frequency. And now I'm hitting the first resonance. It's coming up. There it is. And that's exactly the shape that you see on the blackboard. Very clear. I shake it here. I have exactly the resonance F1. Let me now try to hit the second harmonic. If I go up a little over the F1, then nothing much happens. It's hard for me to see. Is this, is this the second harmonic or is this already the third? It's already the third. <laughs> Let me see whether I can get the second. I think I got it now. Do I? Okay, so here you see the second harmonic. You see indeed that note, that point standing still. And the amplitude is enormous. That's a characteristic for a resonance frequency. We call it also a normal mode frequency or a natural frequency. It's all the same thing. And let me now try to generate one that is very high, as high as I possibly can. And you tell me which harmonic it is. All you have to do is count how many nodes there are, not counting my hand and his hand, and you add one, and that is the harmonic that I generate. The system is not too happy, you see. You feel it sort of when it comes, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. I see now I'm off resonance. It's very hard for me to hit resonance, but I will get it. There it comes, there it comes, there's no question now. I got it, I'm on resonance now, look at it. Clearly I'm on resonance. So how many did you count? Six harmonic? Look, twelve to me, but okay, you count better than I can. Okay, thank you very much. So you see here how a system responds to a driver and a complicated system like a st string has many, many of these resonance frequencies which we call the normal modes. Now when you have a, a violin, you have four strings. They all have the same length. There are musical instruments like a piano, whereby the length is different. Violin, four strings, all the same length. You can set the tension. Tension is changed normally when you tune the instrument before you start playing. But these four strings all have a different mass, and that gives them a very different frequency. Now, if you play the violin, you cannot change the tension, of course, during the playing. That would be a little difficult, although there are instruments that exist where actually the playing depends on the tension of a string. 
with a violin, that's not the case. So with a violin, the only option you have while you're playing it is to make the string length shorter. And you do that by moving your finger along the string. By making it shorter, the frequency goes up, and by making it longer, the frequency goes down. Now, how do you excite a musical instrument like a piano string or a violin string? There is nothing that is driving it exactly at that resonance frequency. So if you want to get a 440 hertz out of a violin string, then you're not driving it exactly at the 440 hertz like we are doing. Well, that's true. But if you take a bow and you rub the string with a bow, then in a way what you're doing is you're exposing that string to a lot of possible frequencies, not just one, but it's a rubbing action. I could also rub it with my finger, or I could pluck it, or I could kick it. And what it does is it ignores all the frequencies which are not at resonance, but it picks out the ones which are at resonance. So striking it with a bow is effectively exposing it to a whole large spectrum of frequencies, and it picks out the ones that it likes. In fact, if you strike a violin string with a bow, you may excite it simultaneously in the first harmonic and in the second and even in the third harmonic, or even higher harmonics, and that makes the difference between the various instruments. That gives it a special tone quality. Depends upon the cocktail, the combination of the various harmonics that you excite.